Welcome to First United Lutheran Church. This is the message from Sunday. It's our prayer that this message touches your heart and helps to guide you in your life. Let's listen. Thanks to Leroy for sharing today. Um, Dean had an opportunity this weekend that um, he's been going down through the summer months to uh, the Free Lutheran Seminary down in, in Minneapolis, taking part in some classes down there. And they asked if he would go out to a small church south of L.A. So that's where he's at today. He's preaching at a small church in uh, south of L.A. that uh, the instructor of these courses that he's been going through uh, asked him if he'd be at. So, uh, so that's, that's a nice opportunity for Dean to reach out and uh, connect with other people and see what else is going on in other areas. But So thank you for Leroy to stepping in. Call Committee and Council has, has sent out a um, letter with a recommendation to uh, uh, call Dean as our pastor. There will be a congregational meeting on August 21, right after church. That's the only item on the uh, uh, agenda today. Worship committee or worship team number five needs a little bit of support. They need some coffee servers, so take a look in your bulletin. You'll see where they need help. Tuesday evening this week is Women's Pizza on the Grill night. So if you haven't signed up for some uh, ingredients, there's a sheet in the back. If you've got questions on it, just talk to Janet and she'll fill you in. Men's Fellowship Tuesday at 7.30, I believe, this week. We'll get that going. Um... Just as a heads up, probably next Tuesday, uh, we're looking at a work day, or at least in the morning, and the plan is the two shrubs in front of the church to take them out, and the two shrubs in the corner of the parsonage to get rid of those. They're just getting overgrown. Then they'll be out of the road for when uh, the painter will come in later this month and paint the church. So that'll try to get that job done and get some uh, stuff there. So probably be about 9.30, a week from Tuesday, come on out for the, for the morning, uh, help us get those out of there, and we'll see how that goes. Is there, oh, and I've got a um, thank you here from the kids on the, on the from mission trip. Thank you to church family for helping us make this trip a reality. We're having a great time. We've had many great adventures already. We love visiting the falls. Appreciate your continued prayers. That's from the uh, youth group. They mailed us a postcard from their trip. Any other announcements? Okay. On the prayer list today, we have Joanne, Linda, and Paula. Any other prayer needs, prayer requests? Okay. Well, let us go to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, and it is with grateful hearts that we come and say thank you for this time together. Thank you for the opportunity to Worship, read your word, share in music. Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for Leroy stepping up and uh, covering the message today, Lord. Bless the words that you've given him to speak to us this morning. We appreciate that. Lord, and we lift up Joanne, Linda, and Paula. Lord, you know their needs. There's different healing that needs to be there. Help them each feel your arms around them. Lift them up. Keep them lifted up through the valleys of life, the troubles and trials that we go through. But we know that as we go through them, you're there with us. And you bring us up to the mountaintops again so we can see the splendor and the glory of your handiwork. Lord, we also lift up Gary and Minnie at Feed My Lambs. We thank you for them going out in the field. Bless the ministry. Bless the work that their hands are doing, the seeds that they plant. May that harvest be large there. Lord, and again, we bring this service, the music, the message, the words, all of that to you. And it's with our open hearts we say, thank you, Lord. Amen. The psalm this morning comes to us out of Psalms 33, verses 12 through 22. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he, he chose for his inheritance. From the heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. 
No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all of its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. One for each hand there, Al. Give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone. I trust, O oh Lord, from thee. Amen. Just 
Thank you, Haley and Heather. We continue with our confessions and forgiveness. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Awesome God, nothing is hidden from you. You see us as we are. You know our desires, weaknesses, and failures. Send us your Holy Spirit today, and cleanse the thoughts of our hearts, so that we may come into your presence with freedom to worship and exalt your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> the Apostle John wrote the following instructions to those who follow Jesus. In 1 John 1, 8 and 9, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Please take a moment in silent reflection before God. Merciful God, we confess that we are addicted to sin and have no power to free ourselves. We have sinned against you by what we think, say, and do. We have left many good things undone. At times, we fail to love you with our whole heart, and we fail to love our neighbors as you have commanded us. Heavenly Father, as your Son Jesus invited his followers to do, we seek forgiveness for every transgression. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, forgive us, heal us, and lead us so that we can grow in our faith and relationship with you. Amen. In the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus told his followers, If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. As a fellow servant of Jesus, I say to you, your sins are forgiven. In Christ, you are given the power to become the sons and daughters of God. In Jesus' name, Receive the comfort and the power of the Holy Spirit. The first lesson today is from Genesis 15, verses 1 through 6. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. The second lesson is from Hebrews 11, uh, verses 1 through 16. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain, did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. 
For before he was taken, he was commended as one who, was, who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. But his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, and even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was unable to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, as he, as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and his countenance as the sand on the seashore. All these people were living still by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have an opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Here reads the lesson, ends the reading for the lessons. We continue with the Apostles' Creed. If you'll please rise for that. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we'll have Leroy come for the gospel and for the message. The gospel. Am I on? The gospel today is found in Luke chapter 12, starting with verse 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens, they do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things. And your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So ends the reading. You may be seated. If you look in your bulletin this morning, the uh, message title is, Am I a Flower? We're not going to touch on that at all. 
I figured most of us want to have lunch and supper sometime today. And uh, by the time I got to that part of the message, it was uh, well into the afternoon. So we're going to cut it a little bit shorter. A young boy was driving a hay rack down a road, and he took the corner a little too short, and the wagon fell over and dumped everything right in front of a farmer's house. The farmer came out, and he saw the young boy crying and said, Son, don't worry about this. We can fix it. Um, dinner's ready right now, so why don't you come in and have dinner with us? Afterwards, I'll come out and help you. We'll get all this hay back on the wagon and send you on your way. And the boy cried, no, I can't. My father is going to be very, very angry with me. Verse said, don't worry. You've got yourself all worked up. Just come in, have some lunch. You'll feel better. We'll get this fixed. And the boy said, I'm afraid my father is just going to be so very angry with me. But the farmer insisted. And so the farmer and young boy went inside and had dinner. Afterwards, they walked outside of the hay rack, and the farmer said, Now, son, don't you feel better after having dinner, after that great meal? The boy said, Yes, but I just know that my father is going to be very angry with me. And the farmer said, Nonsense. Where is your father anyway? And the boy said, He's under that load of hay. <laughs> Life is inevitable. Life is full of cares and concerns, which we do well to consider. Uh, the young boy was very smart in considering that maybe he should move the hay and, and get his father out. Clearly, it's a good thing to be concerned about our lives and to take care, considering our actions, our responsibilities, our duties, caring for other people around us. For many of us, however, there are times in our lives when being concerned turns into worry. When being careful to handle our responsibilities morphs into anxiety, which distracts us and even sometimes consumes us and threatens to consume the world around us. The things which we love are loved best by trusting God with them. The things that we care about are cared best by placing our faith not in our ability to care for them, but in God's sovereign grace. It's been said that worry is much like interest paid on a debt not yet owed. Who among us would go up to Citizen State Bank tomorrow and ask them to start, we'd like to start paying interest on a loan without taking out the loan? Now, believe me, Citizen State Bank or any bank would love you. But none of us would do it. Anxiety and worry about the fear is the same way. Most of us will find ourselves trapped in patterns of worry at times in our lives. While still others find themselves so ensnared by anxiety and worry, they simply cannot find the strength to free themselves. In order to live a grace-filled life which God intended for us, in order to be free from worry, free to live a life of active participation in God's grace, we must first learn to control our thought life. We must learn to replace thoughts of worry with thoughts of trust. Thoughts of anxiety need to be replaced with the knowledge of God and what he can do. It's, remember, it's important to remember there's a distinction between legitimate concern and worry. It is right to be concerned, even to some extent worried about, say, walking in an unsafe area. My wife had to drive to the cities yesterday, and I don't know that she's ever drove there alone before, or she has my youngest daughter with her, and had to go to the airport, and... Uh, she was concerned, probably even worried, because usually we get to about to St. Cloud, and she drives all the time. If you know me, I don't like to drive. Um, there's so much of God's world outside the window that I forget about that great thing in front of me called a road. And so it's best if somebody else drives. I'm kind of a scatterbrain on that. And uh, 
So my wife always drives. We get to St. Cloud, and all of a sudden, there has to be a rest stop. And we come out from the rest stop. She's in the passenger seat because she doesn't like traffic. And so she probably had some worries yesterday about driving there and having to do the driving alone, especially without me as a co-pilot, at least. What I'm discussing is more the worry which distracts us from knowing and loving God. The worry that Jesus talks about is the kind that has the power to overtake us and distract us from knowing God's grace. I'm also very aware there are many people who struggle with anxiety. I used to work as a mental health professional in a, a private school counseling teenagers who many of them were overridden with anxiety about stuff they had no control over. And so I'm aware that some people need to seek professional care or counseling, even medication. I have no intention of trivializing, you know, making that trivial or anything like that because there's some real pain and stress that can come about in people's lives. But I'm convinced, though, that the Bible speaks to all areas of your life, your mind, your body, and your soul. As we apply the teaching of Christ in regard to worry, may we find a place of refuge from anxiety and a means of growing in the grace of God. In this gospel this morning, Jesus lays out a two-part method for finding freedom from worry. We must capture our thought life is the first one. Human beings have been made in the image of God. Have you stopped and thought of that? You know, when I looked in the mirror this morning to make sure my hair was perfect, got a new haircut because the other one was ugly, <laughs> I never thought that man in that mirror is made in the image of God. Did any of you? We are wonderfully thought-filled beings with unimaginable complexities, capacities, and capabilities. All those big words. Our minds are just unfathomable what they can do. And very active. And sometimes it's very easy to become overcome with our own thoughts. One not need to look very far or for very long to find a great many things to occupy, occupy, fill, and eventually consume one's mind with concern and worry. It amazes me as I work in construction and you walk by a plumber or those who don't know I'm an electrician by trade. And so we're on a big job site. I'm working in Grand Forks, an apartment building. And uh, you walk by and they say, did you hear about this? Did you hear what our president's doing? Did you hear what our governor's doing? Did you hear what's happening here or there or wherever? Very seldom is it. Did you hear about the great thing that happened today? No good news. Everyone's concerned. Second Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. and We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What a challenge. Worry is a battle that takes place primarily in the mind. The trouble is that most of us have convinced ourselves that our internal situation our internal state of peace or lack of peace is determined primarily by what's going on around us. And to be sure, when life is just going crazy around us, when our circumstances are at their worst, it's more difficult to capture our thoughts in order to bring them into submission with the will of God. The point here is not that our external circumstances don't matter. Many, many times they were important. I worry about my jobs. I worry about my people that are supposed to be helping me do these jobs. And a lot of times I just have to make a choice. 
We'll allow our thoughts to spin out of control or learn to take them captive to make them to be obedient to Christ. Notice that nowhere in the New Testament does it say, do not have problems. See, we kind of think that as Christians, maybe that's what God should have put in there. Instead of all this other stuff about being with us in our problems, he should have just put in there, you will not have problems. It would be so much easier. While you cannot choose your circumstances, you can choose your response. Life comes at us very fast. Whether it's the immediate concerns of your job or, or maybe you're retired, it might be concerns about money, it might be concerns about uh, children, grandchildren, people around you, the neighbor who just can't mow their lawn on time, all these other things that we worry about. We can easily find ourselves trapped by worry and anxiety. About 20 years ago, I was in federal law enforcement training. And they told us you will do some dumb things if you're ever in an intense situation. If you ever ended up in a, a shootout, a gunfight, whatever you want to call it, it sounds real glamorous, but it wasn't. It has been proven time and time again People will be trying to reload their firearm while holding an empty magazine. That's where the bullets are stored. That empty magazine is of no good to you. You will never have time to reload it. You will never be able to use it for anything. But your mind will hang on to it. If you take it out in your hand, you will hang on to it. Even if it's in your way. Even if it prevents you from putting a new magazine in you will hang on to it. So they never let us, in all of our time, touch an empty magazine. We're in a building. There's maybe 10 of us in there at a time. We're shooting 500 rounds in an hour. And every time you're done with it, you turn it sideways, you push a button, it shoots on the ground. You put the new one in. Some of them got stepped on. They got dinged. They fell on the ground. This is concrete with all kinds of brass cartridges on it and stuff. Some of them got stepped on and ruined, and you'd think, what a waste. I mean, we know not to grab it when we need it later, but, you know, just tell us. But they said muscle memory is what you'll go with. And I never really believed that, but about a year, year and a half ago, I took concealed carry classes at my house. And I don't own a firearm, so I borrowed one from my brother. And when I shot the seven shots, I released the magazine on the ground. And people looked at me like I was strange because it had been 15 years, 20 years but that's how I'd been taught. Train yourself, and it will be instinct for later on. So it is with your thought lives and the thing in your life you worry about. If we're going to take captive every thought, we're going to have to slow our thoughts down to a reasonable pace. When our minds are racing with worry of this thing and that thing and that thing, we have to learn to slow our thoughts in order to capture them and bring them into submission to Christ's will. How often do we find ourselves worrying over something we can't control? How much of our anxiety is centered on things that will dissipate if just given a little time to dissolve? In Luke 12, 25, Jesus says, Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? These are those people who eat kale every day. Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? One of the greatest bits of advice I ever learned, and when I do marriage counseling, this is the one thing I say. To prevent arguing with my wife, I need to consider 
Will it matter in 10 minutes? Will it matter in 10 days? And will it matter in 10 years? We often fight and argue about things that won't matter in 10 seconds. The church we attend in Canada before COVID had a huge argument, probably the biggest, well, second biggest argument in the church ever, and it was the color of the carpet. And they went with blue. Can you believe that? Blue? <laughs> blue? Does it matter? And I'm sure there were some very worried uh, older ladies in our church who wasted their time and sometimes friendships over a color of a carpet. We must learn to let go of worry over things that are out of our control. Things that we can't control. Let go of them, not in defeat, throwing in the towel, but in recognition that our efforts are futile. Then they're self-defeating. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. At the root of worry are misconceptions about the nature of reality. We must learn to confront false beliefs. Once we've slowed our thoughts to a point where we can capture them, then we must examine what we believe. We live in a world which is full of lies. Every television commercial, billboard, internet search, TikTok, Facebook post, post, and latest fad promises to make us happier, healthier, live longer, and wiser. And a lot of this happens through just a, a kind of a, I hate saying subliminal message because that kind of got a bad connotation back in the 80s. But you don't realize that that little gidget on the, on the TV or radio that's going to take away half your work, if you bought two of them, you'll still have work to do. We're bombarded with ideas that somehow we're not getting all that we deserve. If we just had the right insurance company. If I listen to the insurance companies on the radio and I, I don't watch TV, I listen to radio because I drive a lot every day, which is why I hate it. But if I picked their insurance company, they would actually owe me money. Because the amount of money they would save me every month is much more than I pay. And if I switched my cell phone to a different company, I think they would have to pay me too because they would save me all this money a month. And I just wonder how it's possible. And so I get the feeling that maybe my companies are ripping me off. All the things I buy. If I just went to Menards on Tuesday, it's 11% off. Well, that's much better than going to Lowe's because they don't even have that option. And Walmart prices are always falling. You know, I'm just waiting till they get to zero. <laughs> and if I took the right medication, I'd be totally healthy. And if I had, you know, all those, my wife just sent me right before church today a picture about this gorgeous window, which would be just awesome if I lived in the tropics, but in northern Minnesota, makes no sense. But you should have seen the look on that lady's face when she was operating this. She was totally happy, and, and I'm not really happy with my kitchen window because it doesn't even open. <laughs> and so we learn through these messages that we're unhappy. We should wonder why at nearly 59 years old that I don't got it made. I mean, I look at these guys, they made a billion dollars in a year off the internet. I mean, they send me ads every day in my inbox that if I just do their program, pay them the $69.99, that within a year I'll be a millionaire, or short $69.99, <laughs> and they'll be the millionaire. 
And not only that, but we're guaranteed in our Constitution. It says right in there, life, liberty, and the permanence of being happy. No, I think it says pursuit, but we kind of read it as permanent. It said, you know, if you live in the United States, you should be happy. And we pick up these false beliefs, just like if you're walking through the woods or the field and you pick up those little tiny burrs on your, on your jeans. And you don't realize it until you get out that all of a sudden these false hoods are stuck to you. And it's easy to see if you talk to a teenager. And as a parent, that's one of your jobs is to keep correcting them to say, no, that's not the way it works. There is a real world out there, and that's not the way it works. Some have likened excessive worry to an addiction. I would liken it much more to an infection, an infection of wrong thinking. Our minds drift from legitimate concern and care into anxiety and worry, largely as a result of wrong attitudes and misconceptions. The world is thrust lie after lie upon us. It is as though the landscapes of our minds are just filled with all these potholes and they can only be filled with the truth of God's word. We have to take our thoughts captive and confront those thoughts which are out of the, out of the will of God and the truth of God. And sometimes those misconceptions are talked right from, from other Christians. God will bless you beyond anything you can want or need. He never promised that. He promised he will meet your needs. Unfortunately, this isn't something you can do just once, you know. You can't just repent and be done with worry. It's a continual and gradual process, a habit you must develop in order to retain your mind, retrain your minds. Romans 12, 2, the Apostle Paul writes, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what we must do if we're to find freedom from worry. We must allow God's word to transform us from the inside out. Second part of finding freedom from worry that Jesus lays out in Luke chapter 12 is to follow after Christ. While the first admonition of Christ was, in a sense, a negative command, do not worry, the second dose of medicine in this cure for worry is the positive instruction to place all your cares on Christ. It's a matter of attention and focus. Redirection. Do not worry. But he doesn't walk away and leave it like that. He says, do not worry, but give it to God. Put the worry on someone who can do something about it. When I'm working on a job and there's something difficult, I open the manual and I read it, and I decide the guy who wrote it was Chinese and he didn't speak English, and his translation makes no sense in German, which I don't read either. And after 66 pages, I find that 1888 number in the back and I call and hopefully I speak to someone who speaks English and oftentimes it's as simple as you need to, to throw the book away and push button B hold it down for three seconds or whatever I go and I go back to the person who knows how it's done last fall I was at, the jo at a job I was going to get a picture and bring it for Connie to put up on the thing, but uh, by the time I figured out where I'd lost the picture, I had to connect 47 phone lines. Does that sound difficult to anybody? It sounds pretty simple, but each one of these phone lines has eight wires. And each one of these wires is a specific color. And so I have two boards. I call punch blocks, they're about this long. And I take 50 of these wires per board. And each little tiny microscopic wire is a specific color and has to be punched in a specific slot. 
and the wires have to be all the right length so you can flip this thing over into its holder and everything sits nice and, and beautiful and the phone company doesn't yell at you. And it works. And you need to make sure that you don't get any of these wires in the wrong spot because each one has a number. And each number has to correspond to the block as to where you put it. Therefore, when your phone rings, it's for you, not your neighbor. Or when your neighbor's phone rings, it's not for you. Now, I had a mission. I wanted to do this. It's the first time I've really had it to this extent. Usually I do a six block. This was a hundred block total. And so luckily things worked out and I sent all my guys home. And I locked myself in the room and I went to work. And I spent a whole day pushing these little tiny wires with this little special tool. But I sent my guys home because I didn't want to be interrupted. I'm the lead on the jobs. And I didn't want to be interrupted 40 times while I was trying to do this. The best thing was to keep my focus on exactly what I was doing and not stop. So that I could get a pattern and a rhythm and a way to do it. And so it is with following Christ in your life. We're on a mission. We're on a mission to declare Christ this world by reflecting his love to all around us. When our minds drift, when our thoughts are everywhere, when we keep getting interrupted by things of this world, when we're consumed, consumed by worry and anxiety, we're not free to live the grace-filled life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, the Apostle Paul writes, Did you not know that in the race all the runners run? But only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get that prize. Concentrate and train and you will be ready. Worry is the waste what you prepared for. I have failed a few tests in my life when I didn't study. Or got really bad grades. The surprise wasn't the bad marks. When I walked into that college classroom, I knew I wasn't going to do well. That wasn't the surprise. The surprise was if I got a good mark. The surprise is when I did well by accident. And oftentimes we think we're surprised when things don't go right. I just don't understand why God isn't working in my life, why, why my life is such a disaster. But what are we training for? Well, well we, we haven't trained at all. I would like to uh, go running with Russell Sorensen. I could probably make it to Holiday. <laughs> and then I'd need a cab back. <laughs> but I see him five miles south of town, still at a dead run. Because he's trained. Because he's trained. He didn't all of a sudden, 15 years ago, run one marathon and say, I got it now. I'll just go run marathons for the rest of my life. That's why you see him running around town every day. Because he knows he has to keep training. In conclusion, in the gospel this morning, verse 29 through 34, Jesus says, do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things. And your Father knows that you need them. But seek this kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. And where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Experiencing God's grace is a moment-by-moment -moment experience of placing my trust in the unseen Christ rather than in the seen circumstances in my life. It's a matter of choosing to trust God's grace in the moment of trial, in the moment of worry. It is choosing to focus on Christ in front of you rather than the terrain which you're walking through. The things in the, this life, the cares of this life, are passing and fleeting. We are to live lives free of worry. If we are to live grace-filled lives, 
We must place our trust in the eternal things which will not pass away. We must let go of this life and in doing so, receive the grace necessary in the moments of this life. Thank you, Leroy. We continue with our communion service. Communion is open to everyone here that believes in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this earthly world and, and go to his Father. We read in John chapter 13 and 14 where Jesus gathered his disciples and he instructed them on what was to come. In John 13, 21, we read where Jesus acknowledges to his disciples that he will even be betrayed that evening. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26, the Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord which was also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took a cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of my new covenant. This is my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So he took the cup, and he took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke it. And he took the cup after supper. This is the blood of my body. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the, the Lord's death till he comes again. I'll ask our communion helpers to come forward. Of the Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and keep us in his grace. We continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand for our closing song, How Great Thou Art. Feel the 
gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art scarce can take it in that on that cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art, how great thou art. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message from First United Lutheran Church.